Welcome, John. Welcome. Six o'clock. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. Eight o'clock. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Center of the universe here in Boise. <laughs> Uh, I think the Chicagoans would beg to differ. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> well, both of my parents are from Chicago, so there you I, go. I'm sure of that. There you go. I'm still Adam, putting I, my. I'm still uh, do not disturbing all 28 devices that could disturb me during this call. <laughs> Do another minute, let a couple more people join. John, I know you sent me a uh, kind of a rundown. Was that in Teams? That is in Teams. It's with uh, Adam, Josh, and, and I, along with you. I try not to read that thread too often. Sure. Just <laughs> probably, probably a good thing. Well, let's get going, shall we? Do it. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, John Vandergeesen. Adam Beckstead and Robert Ritson Thaler, REM Capital. This is our monthly educational series, uh, kind of a town hall style, where um, a little bit later um, in the hour, we'll ask people to come off of mute and ask a, a few more questions. We do have some uh, previous questions that were emailed in ahead of time when, when people registered. So uh, we'll, we'll start off with those, but before that, um, if you're new to us, I'm John Vandergeesen. Um, I'm a VP and partner. Uh, I focus on the business development and investor relations side of thing. We have Adam Beckstead. Adam, say hello. Good evening, everyone. I am a VP of acquisitions. I, I uh, shake all the bushes and beat everyone down to bring you the best deals. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That, that, can, can you, can you, Stick with that introduction moving forward. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> That's great. And then, of course, we have Robert Ritson Thaler, uh, president and CEO of REM Capital. Yep, yep. I've got 10 bucks invested in this deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's great. Okay. So, uh, Robert, could you start us off with a little bit of a background on REM Capital, um, assets under management, territory, just a little bit of a, a high-level overview for folks that might be tuning in for the first time? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to give an update. Um, so, where are we? Well, since last time we closed one deal, I think, since our last Q&A. Correct. Um, we have about... I think we're somewhere in the 80 to 90 employee count goes up every week. Working our tails off to find good people is definitely a full-time job these days, but well worth the effort. Um, you know, I don't know what our AUM is at this point. I would say somewhere in the four to 450 range. I know we're going to be past 500 by the end of October, just because that's kind of a, you know, half a billion rolls off the tongue easier than 450 million. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that AUM for folks that are new is assets under management. Yes, right. Um, I think we've got, uh, well, like you mentioned, we've got a couple of good opportunities coming up, um, mm -hmm. which I know folks have probably seen out there, which you'll mention a little bit more about. Um, I believe our distributions year to date on an annualized basis is about seven, somewhere between seven, eight million bucks. So that's kind of cool. We're up to a pretty good number there on Love our cash flow. Cash flow is good. That's what we're here for. You bet. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just a lot happening. The the uh, ground up development deal is going vertical here shortly. Just had a great update with the guys there, so I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, and then I guess the other, you know, kind of the other big thing that we're working on is we've decided to officially break out renovations as a 
a, a true vertical in the company. Um, similar to how we rolled out property management about two years ago, where it was kind of, you know, inside of Adam and myself just doing stuff. And we said, okay, time to break it out. And we've realized the need. We probably could have done it a year ago, but definitely there for sure now that we're going to have an entirely separate vertical just for renovation. So I'm excited about that. You know, it's always a big uh, project to build out a new vertical in your business, but one that I think is going to really give us uh, the next step in our trajectory um, and, and really put us on a good path because, you know, we're value add guys. So we've got to be, we got to be top of the business when it comes to renovations. So anyway, yeah, lots awesome. going on. Lots going on. Always is exciting stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, so with uh, opportunities right now for your reference, um, if, if you aren't invested with us currently, or, or maybe still looking at uh, our latest opportunities, we still have a couple of slots in Avenue 33. That was a $58 million purchase in Atlanta. Uh, and we love Atlanta because it has incredible stats with jobs, jobs diversification, and, and, um, and population growth as well. And I just put something out on LinkedIn earlier today, but uh, man, uh, Atlanta's on a tear right now. And you kind of wanna, you wanna invest with that sort of uh, uh, increase in, in those metrics that matter. Because at the end of the day, uh, if you can go with markets that are really, really healthy and going in the right direction, it, it makes your investment, um, I don't wanna say a sure bet, but closer to a sure bet for sure. So Avenue 33, great opportunity there. Uh, distribution starts September 15th and uh, Marbach Park in San Antonio, that's our 304 unit asset that uh, is oversubscribed uh, by quite a bit. So I think some folks are gonna drag their feet and miss out on that one, but that's okay because we have Avenue 33. We also have our new 208 unit city park opportunity. That's also uh, an Atlanta-based asset, and uh, that one just opened up this last week. So if you want to schedule an individual call to talk with us about that more, I uh, would love to do that. And uh, with that in mind, let's move on to the questions. So Iris and Andy, they wrote in, they said, uh, since the Fed is increasing the interest rates, what is the impact on the cap rate of the multifamily arena? Uh, examples being Atlanta, San Antonio, a couple of uh, places that we're actively working on right now. Are they trending lower recently? Um, Adam, kind of a 30,000 foot question on that. Can you start us off with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely wouldn't say that cap rates are trending lower because as the cap rates go lower, the valuations go up. I would say if anything, the cap rates are inching a little bit higher, meaning that the valuations are coming down a little bit. Um, this is a little bit uh, in direct relation to the debt market that has gone up. So debt is becoming more, more expensive at this point, which is lowering the values of the properties. And this is great for us because this is what's been given us our recent discounts on both Marbach Park in San Antonio and City Park. Marbach, we got a $2 million cut. Um, off of our original price. In City Park, we got three and a quarter million off. So that's uh, that's um, a wonderful time when you can shave off millions. Um, but we do still conservatively um, underwrite with our cap rates. So we are always projecting that cap rates are going to go up in our underwriting. So if cap rates still stay somewhat level, our under eye is actually projecting that's going to go up. So that's always a good thing. And I would not be surprised if cap rates don't stay where they're at, if not inch a little bit lower and raise values up because people are trying to get rid of their money. They're trying to invest it into cash flowing assets rather than keeping it in the bank and losing out to all this inflation going on. So uh, I would say that's my uh, 30,000 foot view. Awesome. Robert, anything to add on that? I'll just add to that, um, Adam is very modest. Those price decreases that we got were actually post PSA. Uh, it doesn't include the pre PSA price decreases that we got, which were is equal to or greater than that. So we've actually got about 5 million on Marbach and probably closer to six on the city park deal in total. So, um, and the reason I say that is because I think that we are seeing some 
price uh, adjustments in the market. And we feel like that's a good opportunity. It's primarily based on the interest rate environment. Cap rates, as Adam mentioned, aren't really moving a whole lot. Now, I think if interest rates stay where they are for an extended period of time, meaning six, nine, 12 months, then I think uh, cap rates will start to adjust. Mm -hmm. But at this point, most people are expecting that there may be a rise in the rates and then it'll come back down first quarter, second quarter of next year. So, you know, it's more of a short term phenomenon where it's based on interest rate cost more than valuations. So, uh, but it does create an opportunity. And we kind of look at it as, you know, if you had to buy that property six months, 12 months ago, same exact cash flow, same exact property, same exact upside, you would have paid five to six million dollars more. So the question is, will that ever, will that five to six million dollars ever come back? Well, if you're a long-term holder, meaning three, five, seven years, I think the answer is absolutely. So it's kind of like if I saw five, six, seven million dollars sitting on the street, would I pick it up? Yeah, I would. Happy to share it with everybody along the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. And to your point about long term uh, on, on interest rate increases and how that might uh, influence cap rates, I believe the last time we had six or seven uh, with increases, I can't remember uh, back back the 2018. last 2018. 2018, yeah. Yeah. They they went up. Sure, we had six or seven increases, but but it, they didn't stay up long enough for cap rates to chase up because real estate is so slow, right. uh, comparatively. Uh, so, uh, and to your point, John, you actually you, you reminded me of something. Twenty eighteen was the best time to buy in the recent past. Anything that you bought in twenty eighteen doubled, tripled. I mean, really good time to now. Relative to the last 20 years, people would say, well, yeah, come on. Okay, that's fine. But in the last five years, that was the best time to buy. So again, not trying to predict the future, but you know, maybe this is a buying opportunity. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So on to Dan's question. Uh, he says, uh, typical multifamily investment, st investment strategies and the role property management companies play in fulfilling investment strategies on behalf of owners. Um, so I think I understand the question. Typical multifamily investment strategies. Well, I mean, there's obviously buy and hold, um, you know, through syndication. Uh, some folks, they kind of have a shorter business plan where they look to, uh, you know, find something that's more distressed to bring it up to, you know, a proven uh, level where, they can, uh, you know, show the direction of the property's improvement and, and dispose of that property in 18 months, 24 months, something along those lines. So it really just depends on the group or individual and, and what they're looking for in the investment. But how property management companies play into that, you live and die by property management. I've heard Adam say, you know, you can take a fantastic asset and have poor property management and, and run the asset into the ground. It could be the right location, could be 2018, could, you know, you, you bought it well, all these things. But if you don't have good property management, we've seen it. Uh, it, it will really tank that asset pretty quickly. And sometimes you, you can't turn around from it. So that's a really important piece to that. Uh, and that is one of the foundational principles of REM Capital is, you know, manage a property at a really high level. So, you know, look for the right metros, look for the right deals. Adam's out there, you know, shaking people and beating bushes, as he said. Uh, but, and then after that, you have to have a really high span of control. And when you do, then you can better drive the value and you're, you're getting closer to that sure bet that I talked about through property management. That being said, uh, we don't have third, property man third party management, but there are some really good firms out there. It's my personal perspective that even the best of property managers that are third party, you're still just one client in their portfolio and you're not getting their, the attention all the time. So, um, but that, that's my personal perspective. Uh, Adam, Robert, anything? I'll, I'll I was just thinking that I wanted to, uh, I think we need like a little video clip when you talk about Adam shaking trees and people. <laughs> 
Hey, you got to do what you got to do. What yeah. am I going to say? But uh, John, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, I think a lot of times what you see in this industry is you have two main type of players in, in here. You have the, as Robert said, us and the long-term hold type of people. And then you have people that are out there, HGTV flipping apartment complexes. They're going in there six months, 12 months, and their whole goal is to renovate, um, have super high performance, or just completely gut the property and, and bring it up to today's standards. And then they're looking to sell it. When you're in there for six to 12 months, management becomes a much less role in it compared to that long haul. I would say the longer you're going to hold it, the more important manage it, management is. However, property management is important all the way around. Mm. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's go to Javier's question. <clears throat> Robert, this one's for you. Um, talk uh -oh. towards underwriting under high rate environments, bridge, no bridge, uh, business cycles, uh, you know, markets to turn to, um, you know, there's a lot there, but you, you pick, how are you, how are you viewing, uh, bridge debt right now? Yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot to unpack in the, that, that, uh, Javier, hey, hey, Javier served it up. We got to unpack it. We're here till midnight folks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so loan cap rates, we'll, we'll start with the easy one. Yeah. Cap rates have gone up quite a bit. They have, uh, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. Cap rates are very volatile and they're 100% based on the forward curve of LIBOR or SOFR. LIBOR is going out. SOFR is kind of the new, the new standard. Um, so the expectation of those forward curves, meaning what do we expect interest rates to do over the next 30, 60, 90, 120 days, you know, one year, two year, that kind of thing. What does that curve look like? So if the expectation is that those rates are going to jump up significantly in the short term, your cap rates are going to go up a lot. If the expectation is that they're going to stay relatively low, then your cap rates are going to be pretty minimal. So what we saw about two or three months ago, everybody thought the world was ending, rates were gonna to go to 9% and cap rates just went through the roof. We're talking 10, 20 times what they were six months before. So huge move. They've come back in since then a little bit because the Fed is you know, kind of given everybody the idea that rates are not going to 9%. You know, They might put a couple more bumps in there, but and, you know, it's not the end of the world. So that expectation has come back, which has meant costs of the cap rates have come in a little bit. That being said, they're still quite a bit higher than they were, you know, six, 12 months ago. So it's all dependent upon the expectations in the market. Because if you think about it, it's the equivalent of somebody taking the opposite side of your bet. You're betting that the interest rates are going to stay low. The other person is betting that the interest rates are going to go high. Uh, excuse me, I said that backwards. Um, what did I just say? <laughs> Strike that. Reverse it. <laughs> reverse whatever I said. Yes. But I'm anyway, to be the, honest with you. At first, I thought you said that it's it's like somebody takes the opposite side of your bed, and I was like, <laughs> where is he going with this? But <laughs> I mean, that there could be a play there too. That's a different conversation. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's basically like you're you're at the table, you're betting against something, somebody else is betting for it or vice versa, depending on which side you're at. So people are trying to make money off that. So their thought is, hey, what are the odds that the interest rates go, you know, more than two points higher than they are today? And how long do they stay there? And what's my cost? And I'm going to then sell Adam a rate cap for, you know, $35 million loan based on the percent, you know, the odds that I think th that the interest rate is going to go past his, uh, his, uh, you know, rate cap amount. So, you know, that's why they go all over the place. And right now they're still pretty high. I would say that for, uh, and Adam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, on a 30, what do we do? $35 million loan. We were, what was it? 500,000 or 350? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was about four fifty. Okay, 
So it's about 450. So you're talking over a point in a rate cap cost. So if you're not factoring that into your underwriting, that will be a shocker. So I would say, make sure that you have that included in your, your pricing. In the past, you know, I mean, you can get a, uh, we did the deal in uh, Dallas uh, two, two years ago, and we got a $28 million uh, rate cap at a, I think it was like a point over strike. And it was like literally 30,000 bucks. I mean, not even worth budgeting. So again, it really depends on what's happening in the market. And that's where you just have to stay current. You have to pay attention to what's going on. So I would be very careful to underwrite rate caps into your underwriting because a point is a big deal. Um, it will definitely change your returns. So I would do that. Um, on that note, real question. quick, the, yeah. the, you, you mentioned SOFR, um, secured overnight financing rate, just for people that don't aren't familiar. It's basically a broad measure of the cost of borrowing money. Yes, so. correct. Did you want to uh, did you want to dig into LIBOR? That's all you. Yeah, John, okay. what does LIBOR stand for? <laughs> I don't I don't I don't even remember what that one stands for. I'd have to use uh, I'd have to use Google Encyclopedia for what the LIBOR definition is. I was just giving you a hard time. Yeah, I always forget I forget SOFR because it's so new and it's Fed based versus, you know, the old LIBOR was the London Interbank overnight rate, which has been around forever. So but anyway, yes, good point. Awesome. Um, Next question. So, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So on the on the point about Bridger, excuse me, Bridger, no bridge. Um, the question here for us is multifaceted. So if you're a long-term buy and hold shop, as we are, generally speaking, you're going to want long-term fixed debt, which typically is not bridge, it's agency. You can get, you know, seven, 10, 12 years. We typically prefer seven, more like 10 year term. That being said, typically that also comes with a pretty steep prepayment penalty. So that means if you wanna sell the deal two years down the road, either somebody has to assume the loan, which can be done, or they're gonna be paying, or you're gonna be paying a pretty steep prepayment penalty. So if you expect the interest rates to drop, then you're probably gonna be a situation where you're not gonna be able to sell your property for the valuation that the market may pay had you not done an agency rate. So you have to think about that because you're taking a risk by doing a long-term fixed rate debt on your property. Um, and that, you know, again, that could be a negative based on your, your business plan. Now, if you're in it for long-term and you're in it for cash flow and you want lower risk, the significant benefit to that is that you don't have to worry about the interest rates. So we've got deals that are 10 years at 4%. So I don't care what the Fed does tomorrow. I don't care what the Fed does in five years. We're paying 4% for the next 10 years, period. And by the way, while that interest rate could go up, could go down too, but let's just assume it's going up and our interest cost is not going up, our rental increases are going up. So during a period of inflation, if you've got a locked in long-term interest rate, your NOI starts to really accelerate. Now expenses go up too, so I'm not saying that it's 100% to the bottom line, but your NOI starts to accelerate more because you've got that fixed rate debt. On the flip side, let's think about, well, why would we do a bridge deal? Well, bridge is a shorter term financial instrument. Let's call it three to five years. Your interest rate is fixed or variable. You can, you can get fixed bridge or you can get a variable. Of course, you can buy a rate cap too, but it's very easy to get out of it. So if I think I'm paying 8% today and two years from now, I think the interest rates are going to be 5%, then I'm going to want to do it. Most likely I'm going to, want to do a bridge deal because it gives me the flexibility to refinance the entire property at a much lower interest rate. So <clears throat> that's one consideration. What do you think the interest rates are going to do? And how long do you plan on holding the property? The other thing to consider, and this has been a recent situation, is that the spread for debt with the agencies uh, about six months ago, maybe nine months ago, it got really wide. Spread meaning what's the premium that you have to pay in order to just get the debt from the agencies? Well, it started to go, it started to just widen out significantly. Now, generally, the spread is based on the risk in the market. Well, the agencies pretty much said, hey, 
you know, we've loaned as much money as we want to loan. We think we want to just step back. So we're just going to start raising the cost, the spread of that money, which slows the volume down. Well, it was kind of bad timing on their part because it was just at a point where there was opportunity in the market for bridge lenders to come in and provide liquidity at a time when the, the agencies were stepping back. So the bridge lenders saw it as an opportunity. They said, hey, you know what? We can make money on a lower spread. We've got tons of money that's ready to go. We're going to go out there and start pushing, uh, you know, pushing our, our, our capital, our debt. Um, and so recently, uh, we've chosen to go the bridge route for two reasons, not just because we think interest rates are going to come down, but because the spread on the agency loans was extremely high. So if you looked at the overall cost of that debt over a five-year period, you were paying you know, millions of dollars more, hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars more by doing, a bridge, by doing an agency loan versus a bridge, a bridge loan. So again, it, it becomes somewhat of a business decision um, because you're giving up some of your stability by going with the shorter term debt. But if you're going to save a million dollars, you got to think, eh, you know, how much stability am I gaining by having an extra million dollars in my pocket at the end of five years that I could then use as fudge factor? And so, again, it's, it's kind of a it's a multifaceted question and it's not a simple straight, well, I shouldn't say it's not a straightforward, it is straightforward, but it's not a simple answer in that sense. There's a lot of things that you have to think about. So that's how I would answer that when it comes to bridge or no bridge. I would expect in the next three, six, nine months, I think the agencies are going to become much more competitive because they have lost a lot of business recently. Um, secondly, the new year, they always get new caps. So they want to go out there and start, you know, knocking away at the, at the a bucket that they've been given, which restarts every January 1st. Um, so my thought is that they're going to get a little more aggressive. They've also had to adjust some of their underwriting because they went into this whole <clears throat> economic uh, situation with the interest rate saying, hey, you know, if you can't hit a, a one, three, one, four debt service coverage, uh, coverage ratio day one, we're not doing your debt. Well, that just doesn't work for value add guys. You know, we're buying things that are one, 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 two, maybe one, oh, and we know that we can go in there and make a cash flow. And we know that's upside, but the agencies aren't willing to uh, see that or adjust to it. So that's been a big, big factor too. So again, you know, it depends on a lot of different factors on whether you do bridge or whether you do agency. Um, I would say in general, we tend to pick agency long-term fixed debt because it is more stable and predictable. But there are times where you must pivot, I think, in order to uh, you know, stay, stay competitive with your capital. So anyway, long answer to a short question, but uh, there's oh, a lot to dig into there. <laughs> Javier definitely got his money's worth on that question. <laughs> Robert spitting some, spitting some gold nuggets there. So um, let's, let's move on to... Uh, Crystal's question, uh, best practices in getting problem tenants out of the property uh, so better tenants can be sourced. Adam? Oh, that video is right there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Back to me, shaking the people. Shaking the, the people. Bushes? Yep. Jeez, we really need to get that video made for you, Robert. Let's Maybe we can <laughs> insert that in the recording here. So, uh, Adam, first thing, what what would be a problem tenant? What 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 is the varieties, different varieties of problem? Oh tenants? wow, um, varieties. That's a, that's a that's a multifaceted answer right there. But uh, you're you're gonna have all kinds. You're gonna have people that aren't on the lease. Um, so a lot of boyfriends that that show up after the lease signing. You're gonna have potential just constant complainers. You're going to have people that um, send in work orders that are, are not even really there. We, we've had uh, people in the past that have the, uh, the fire, the firemen come every, every week for claims that are unjust and they show up there, nothing there, they leave and, and it can get pretty crazy. So you have people there, you have, um, you have drug activity. Um, sometimes you have drug dealers. Sometimes you have abuse. Sometimes you just have people that are verbally abusive to the staff. So 
um, wide gamut of people that you would want to get rid of when you're taking over property. Maybe you're not even taking over property. You're just realizing, hey, my uh, my my uh, tenant mix really needs to change. So, so sure. yeah, that's quite a few different well, people. So where that, I think what you're talking about is where you are at in your business plan with yeah. the property as well. And, and sometimes you're looking for more vacancies so that you can turn more units over with a partial or full renovation package. A lot of different things to, to, to go with there. Um, how, how, do you, how do you implement that strategy, Adam? Well, first and foremost, um, you, kinda, you have to think about where, I mean, assuming you're taking over the property and you just bought it, you have to realize that the old management um, may not have been there for these people. So you really have to show up and start building trust with the people on site. There's a lot of times where we take pe- take over properties and what some people would call problem people are really just disgruntled by how they were treated in the past. So, so showing up, showing the people that you're there, you're ready to take over work orders, get to it timely, that you really care about them can go a long way. And after that, you want to make sure that the property is safe for these people. So if you have any safety concerns as far as the gates aren't working, or maybe you want to get security cameras in there, maybe you have to go as far as having police officers or security patrol going around. Um, but you want to you want to create a safe environment, and that shows the residents that you're there to that you care about them, that you're there for them. But and then, Adam, I think I think you're missing the punchline though. Okay, what's the punchline, Robert? What, what's the best practice in getting them out of the property? Um, shaking them and beating them in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. I'm like, you're missing the punchline here. How do we get these people out other than potentially shaking them? <laughs> well, yeah, 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 all right, all right, all right. Fair yeah. enough. Much too literal of an answer there, but. I mean, you know, you have to figure out who you're dealing with. And sometimes uh, sometimes you're able to transform some bad people of what people will call bad into good. So, right. But let's just assume they're bad people and we want yeah. to get rid of them. Yeah. What, okay. what do we do to, you know, what yeah. are our creative strategies to, or best practices to get them out? Perfect. Um, number one is going to be a non-renew. So if they have a lease and they're a problem resident, you non-renew them if their lease is coming up. Um, you don't have to do an eviction. You just say, hey, we're, we're giving you the opportunity to find a place elsewhere. And then you non-renew them. You have um, people that maybe their renewals far out and you really want to get rid of them. Sometimes it's just a cash for keys kind of thing. You're giving them, hey, we're going to give you two, $300 to, to just vacate. Um, can be pretty effective, you know, and depending on how bad you want to get them out is how much maybe you want to pay them. Um, obviously there's evictions. If there's, um, lease violations, you can evict the people. So if they do have people in there that are um, not supposed to be there, um, you can evict them from that. Um, some extreme cases, um, could be a, um, a police, um, a police visit. Um, we've actually had some people, um, friends of ours that have actually scheduled for the local canine training day where they would come bring the dogs around and guess what? You put that notice out there that uh, that day is going to be canine. All of a sudden there's some problem people that are going to leave. And you know what? You do that enough times and um, it, it kind of clears some of those people out. <laughs> it, so I think that there's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of nuance. And, you know, I think that on-site property management, one of the things that they have to do, it's, which is a, uh, an art and a skill is to be kind of a people whisperer too, because there are a lot of different folks on properties. You have a, a 300 unit complex, you, you see the gamut of, of things. Uh, you know, when we do property tours, we'll walk through unit A and it looks like a show unit. I have to like double check my notes to see if it's the, if it's a show unit or somebody actually lives there. And then you go across the breezeway to unit B and you're scratching your head thinking, when did you think it was a good idea to turn the second bedroom into a chicken coop and, uh, you know, have a, 
have a mural on the wall that you painted yourself and you know like there's stuff like that you shake your head at so there are a lot of different folks out there we always look to work with folks that that really do want to be at the complex they they like what we do and we're always trying to up that that experience because when we do get those great tenants uh we have people that want to stay longer so that means that we don't have as much turn on the property and that goes to our bottom line and it's a win-win we're making a better community for people and we're having greater success with the business plan so well said awesome stuff all right we're gonna skip the number five robert you kind of crushed the bridge debt conversation already <laughs> and we're going to answer glenn are you ever going to offer 1031 exchanges so a point of clarification we do offer 1031 exchange you can come into the property with a 1031 uh, that's a tax deferred scenario when you sell a property and we do offer that it is a million dollar minimum for us and we do have some folks that you know let's say that your sale is 750 and uh you know you make up the difference in cash that's we've had that happen before uh and it's the 1031 into the property with us into the next acquisition is something that happens quite regularly now on the way out of the property you know one of the things that we look to do every time is to continue to defer tax uh, on the capital gains and 1031 and roll over into a, a new asset so that way our investors get uh, that equity multiple, uh, you know, and they're getting a really great cash on cash return at that point in time too. So uh, we do offer that that situation to as a point of clarification. We do, and we we usually have one or more ten thirty one exchange partners on all of our deals these days. We don't market it that much. Probably should do more of that. Um, yeah. but they do and it's it's a great it's a great vehicle if you've already got quite a you know a significant amount of equity that's sitting in an existing asset that maybe you are you know managing hands-on and you're ready to say hey i want to be a passive investor i won't just want to collect my check um but you know you want to have it managed by a group that knows what they're doing so it can be a, a great uh, vehicle to do that and what john mentioned too that's nice if you come in with a, with a 1031, you then also have the option when we sell the property to take your money and go put it in something completely different. Um, you know, the people that are part of the syndication have to, they don't have to, but we, you know, they need to roll their money with us in order to keep it there. If you come in as a 1031, technically you don't have to. So you kind of have uh, a little bit more flexibility in that respect because you could say, well, you know, I had a great run with REM for five or 10 years, but now I want to go, you know, buy a warehouse down the street that, you know, my friend is going to rent from me for, you know, some great amount of money. So, you know, whatever, I'm just, you know, you never know, but it gives you some flexibility. But uh, anyway, so a little bit, a little bit more color there to add. Yeah, to what you that's, that's a great point on equity too. You mentioned time and equity and I, I talk to a lot of people every week and it's interesting because there are a lot of folks out there. There's an incredible amount of 1031 exchange money floating around. In addition, people's portfolios and their lives are always changing. So sometimes they've held properties for quite a long time and they're looking at that saying, man, I've got, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. I've got a couple of million dollars of equity just sitting. Right. You know, I, I want I want to harvest that equity. I'd like to get it multiplied, get it cash flowing a little bit more, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, which is the beauty of of well, I mean, it's a double edged sword when you're financing because if you allow your financed property to uh, sit for long enough, you know your your return kind of is diminished. Uh, right. Some inefficiencies there. So, and then you, also some people say they say you know, man, I I used to love managing my my 26 doors. And now, you know, I've got three kids and, uh, you know, whatever their situation personally changed and they're looking for a little bit more time freedom. And that way, you know, what we offer is a great opportunity to get a great return, get the benefits of real estate, but, you know, not have to, uh, pick up the, pick up the phone and, you know, go out on site and, you know, deal with those tenants that Adam portrayed. 
So. Taking people, <laughs> beating bushes. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to add too, John, you know, maybe it's from people that had three kids and now the kids left and the kids used to do all the property management. <laughs> And that too. Like, forget this. I'm not cleaning toilets. <laughs> that too. That too, for sure. Um, I had somebody the other day, just as a point of reference, that called me up talking about a 1031. And they had about two and a half million dollars sitting in an asset, very low basis. They had not re-leveraged the property, which they didn't want to. And they were getting the equivalent of about one and a half percent return on their money. Oh. So the idea was take that equity, roll it into a 1031. You don't have to, you know, you're not having to go to work every day to, to get your, your monthly check. And you're going to instantly increase that return from one and a half to, you know, 15 to 18 to 20%, whatever it is, um, in a fairly low risk deal. It's, it's an absolute no brainer. So those are the kind of things that, you know, sometimes to your point, um, we forget, hey, that equity is sitting there and it's really not doing anything for me. And if I take that out and put it into a 1031, I'm not paying any taxes on it, but I'm going to get the higher return on the increased capital. It's an absolute win-win. So Right. Yep. Excellent. All right. Uh, Chris asks, cash flow and exit mechanics for multifamily real estate from the individual investor's point of view. So that's another 30,000 footer. But in general, I think it's important to understand why you're investing, what you want to get out of it for results. And if you are focusing on cash flow, uh, then get really clear on how active of an investor you want to be. And if, if you're kind of going more towards, well, I'd rather just get the benefits of real estate into specific properties, uh, the benefits of multifamily, you know, but I, I just like my monthly distribution a email about how the property's functioning and my my tax advantages with with k1s uh, which cost depreciation uh, or cost segregation excuse me by depreciation is a completely another topic but if you're that kind of an investor then i would say just align with a, a individual or group uh, like us that are, are doing things that make sense to you from an investment perspective and and then let real estate uh function, how real estate functions over the long term and, and reap the benefits of that. So um, I hope that answers your question, Chris. Uh, if not, I'm going to follow up with you and make sure that we've hit all that. So John, can I add one thing to that too? Love it. I think that uh, there's two perspectives, which you kind of touched on. One is I want to build my, my uh, capital quickly. So kind of, the, kind of going back to the single family fix and flip model, I want to take $100,000, put 20 in, sell it for 170, make 50,000, boom, done, you know, six months, 12 months. That's great. But at the end of the day, you've got yourself a job. You do not have yourself passive income. So I think the strategy is for a lot of people, figure out what that capital amount, what that, that nest egg amount needs to be, work towards that amount. And as you get closer to that amount, start peeling off uh, you know, a, a greater percentage of that money and putting it into a cash flowing asset. Because the goal at the end of the day, I think, is to get that nest egg into a cash flowing asset that is also appreciating, that is also essentially tax free. If you can do that and really focus on that, I think that's where most people are trying to get to. Um, but I feel like a lot of times you get bits and pieces of it because you go to a, you know, you go to a single family conference and they say, you know, uh, Burr method, just, just, you know, flip, 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 flip. Okay. Yeah, sure. You know, if you need to build capital, that could be a great way to build your capital quickly. Um, or, you know, you go to another conference and it's all about cash flow, and you're thinking, yeah, I don't have $2 million to invest. I got 200,000. How am I going to get to 2 million? You know, so there's a lot of different pieces along the way that I think are important to understand. And so the, the balance of cash flow and when you exit a certain thing and go into another, it, it's all a big factor. I think the other thing, which John mentioned is you also have to think about your earning potential where you're at. Now, if you say, hey, listen, I just hate my job. I don't care that I make a half a million dollars a year. It's terrible. Okay, I'm probably going to tell you that you're crazy for leaving. 
suck it up for a couple more years and dump every penny you can into multifamily and retire. But hey, <laughs> but I think it's important to think about your earning potential in the industry or the job that you're in, because it kind of, again, comes back to numbers. You're not going to quit your job and go do multifamily or single family and make $400,000. It takes time to build up that cash flow. And you may say, well, yeah, but I can go flip four houses and make 200 grand. That's great. That 200 grand, once you're done with those four houses, means absolutely nothing unless you flip four more houses and then four more houses and then four more. So again, you kind of got to think, what's my exit here? How do I get out of this rat race? And a lot of times it makes more sense to stay in the job, even if it's a W-2. And I know we're like, oh, it's terrible. Don't work for the man. Hey, if the man's paying you half a million dollars a year and you have a potential to continue making that for several years, I say stay in it and have a, have a mindset of build your capital and your cash flow. Um, so again, I think that it kind of goes back to the bridge, bridge question. It's not a simple question. There's a lot of different pieces involved in it. Um, and I like to advise people based on their individual situation, and their individual goals. Um, yep. And again, you know, you may say, hey, I don't care. I'm 25 years old. I'm making $50,000 working at, you know, Amazon. I'm going to quit my job and go flip houses. I'd say, yeah, you know what? Why not? Go for it. Just see what you can do and, and you know, make, make a better income. Um, but not everybody's in that situation. So I just, I think it's important to think about that because I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the folks that give advice, um, it, it's missing pieces or it's, it's a little slanted and I think it's more nuanced. And uh, I just like to always give people the full, the full picture so that hopefully you can make whatever the best decision is for you to achieve that cash flow and that exit um, that you're trying to achieve. And then it, again, you know, if it's a point in your life where you're trying to just completely get out of multifamily real estate because you know, maybe you're retired and you just want to spend your money, I always ask people, why do you want to get out? Is it because you've been working so hard doing your own management? Okay, well, don't get out of the space. Just transfer from an active role to a more passive role. Find some assets, you know, find some investment opportunities where you can get strong cash flow. You're still invested in real estate. You know the space. Makes sense to stay in it. Just find a good operator that you can trust for your for your investment dollars. Um, so anyway, a couple more points that you know I hope find. Uh, you know, folks can find relevant to that, that question. It, it seems like it's always, a, it depends. And inevitably we're looking for just the one pill, Robert. So, right. <laughs> we're not finding it still, but that's all right. Uh, just write off my student debt. That's all I need. Just write it off. <laughs> that's all I need. Uh, let's open it up. So we, we want to hear from you uh, in the audience, uh, participate a little bit, ask a question. We've got about 15 minutes left and the only caveat you got to come off mute and you have to come off uh you have to turn on your video How about i was that? gonna say bonus points for videos but you're it's yeah. a no no, for no job. i'm coming down with a hammer <laughs> uh there was one question in the chat john i'll just jump on that oh, yeah. real quick yeah. well uh, somebody may be thinking of a question so sarah asked how do you determine replacement cost in the area of properties so Replacement cost is generally a single family topic, which is more based on, uh, you know, okay, I'm buying it at, at $100,000 and the replacement cost is 120, you know, why am I doing that? However, in multifamily, there's a little bit of a consideration of replacement cost when it comes to new build. Generally not so much on a BNC class because you're buying it for significantly less than replacement cost. Um, but, if you're in a, let's say you're in a really nice area, you're looking at an A-class property, maybe even a B-plus property, the minute that that gets at or above your replacement costs, you got to start asking questions about whether it makes sense. So long story short, getting back to your question, how do you determine the replacement cost? The easiest way is to either look at a new development deal, you know, call a broker, ask them, hey, you know, what are we selling this deal for? Obviously, there's a, there's a premium on top of that for the development. Um, but Let's just say it's, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, probably 20, 30, maybe 40% on top of that cost. So if, if I go to Dallas tomorrow and I'm looking at a high rise and they're selling it for $350,000 a unit, I can probably take 30%, 100 grand a pop off of the top for 
uh, development profit. So that means their hard cost is $250,000 a unit just to build it. Probably actually more than that because for high rise in Dallas, it's, it's more than that. But how do I know that? Just talking to people, talking to developers, talking to brokers, kind of getting a sense of what's out there. And it does vary by market. Probably more importantly, it varies by type of construction. So Dallas versus, uh, you know, Atlanta, not too far off in construction for garden style, but you go from garden style to podio to high rise, very different cost structures. Um, so that's, that's probably something I would say, you just have to ask a lot of different questions to find out where you're at. Um, but again, it's not, usually it's not as big of a question if you're looking at Workforce housing, um, because you're buying it at you know fifty thousand, eighty, hundred, hundred thousand dollars a door, versus you know your new builds that are that are two hundred plus. So anyway, hope that answers your question. Awesome. Okay, anybody else have another question? Can you uh, go over composite K ones? Yeah, I'll answer that one. <laughs> Please. Um, and specifically, what are you wondering about the composite K1? Uh, just what that means as far as taxes, really just kind of the uh, uh, mile high level. Um, um, I, I really don't know much about the composite K1s at all. I'm relatively uh, new to the to the space and um, I'll be getting K1s after uh, this calendar year. But um, I heard okay. that term mentioned in another uh, call last week. And um, so just looking for a little more clarity on exactly what a composite K1 is and, and what that means as far as the tax implications. Sure, okay. Yeah, so at the end of the day, really there's nothing different than a K1. It's just passing through income and expenses from multiple entities versus one. Um, some folks structure their deals differently, like a fund or something like that. They may structure it as a composite K-1. But at the end of the day, it's the same basic principle. You're getting a pass-through of your pro rata income and expense for that property. Um, so that's why I was just curious if there was a specific issue that you'd run into. But in general, it's no different than you getting a K-1 and you're going to report that on your, you know, your LLC or your personal tax return, depending on how it is. So, Thanks. I appreciate that, Matthew. Anybody else? We might not, we might get off early. Excuse me, ooh, real quickly. Yeah, uh, what is your uh, sentiment on like a BTR product or like kind of these like more alternatives to uh, traditional multifamily? BTR meaning build to rent. Yes. Right. Well, it's certainly been uh, a really popular space and uh, you know, it's, it's been nice because I don't know, in, in my opinion, Robert, I feel like it's the, uh, the true value add uh, you're going from, from dirt up. <laughs> so you're, you're adding a, you're adding a ton of value at that point in time, but I don't know. Uh, Robert has a lot more, uh, in that space than I do as far as knowledge base. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, kind of a bridge between single family one-offs versus buying 200 single families, right? In the same area as a portfolio. Um, it's kind of that middle ground where it's not multifamily, but it's not single family, it's a BTR. <laughs> Sorry. And the nice thing from a <clears throat> investment standpoint as a developer and investor is that you know the product that you're getting uh, coming out of the ground, which is you know nice to know. And I think it's a great, uh, great vehicle you know, we obviously don't do BTR, but I think it's a great vehicle for investment. And it really comes down to who you're partnering with at the end of the day, what their experience is in that space and whether they know how to manage it, just like multifamily, um, because that's really what's going to determine the long-term success of it. And really, it, from even from a short-term perspective, can they build it for the cost that they say they're going to? Do they have a track record? You know, all that kind of stuff. Do they have quality materials, construction, et cetera? So... I think outside of that, if you can answer all those questions and say, yeah, they're good guys, good opportunity, um, I would look into it. Absolutely. Um, you know, because it's, it's, it's the, the similar risk structure to a new development deal in multifamily, which definitely has more risk, but 
you know, for somebody that's younger like yourself and you've got, you know, long run room and, you know, you don't, I wouldn't put hundred percent of your capital into a deal like that, but, you know, maybe take 20% of whatever, get a little higher return. Yeah. Why not? Um, you know, there's some guys out there that I feel are a little bit, uh, I don't know, overly negative about the BTR space. Like, oh, it's risky because it's single family. Okay. Yeah. I mean, again, it comes down to management. You have all these individual buildings and you have, you know, four sides of every single unit that you have to take care of and maintenance and all that stuff. But people have been doing single family portfolios for years and it works. So I don't think it's, I think it's a, a very viable investment opportunity. Um, and it, you know, really, it just comes down to the partner that you're working with and their experience, I think. So, you know, I mean, I personally, I think there's a little added risk and that's why I think it's maybe more critical when it comes to that part. I think it's a little bit added risk because you are spread out um, versus one building that has, you know, well, not one building, but uh, you know, 10 buildings that have 200 units versus 200. So, you know, um, but again, if that's all you do and that's your wheelhouse, then I think, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of guys that are doing a great job at it. So the, the demographics and the trends are certainly there for it. I mean, yeah, mentorship in general in America is up and also what that product is. Sometimes people like their own garage and they like their own backyard and yeah. they like their own home, uh, but they just are going to rent yeah. it. So uh, there's right. certainly merit there. Yeah, I was saying pretty cool communities that I've seen that are, you know, BTR communities. So. Yeah, you, you lose some efficiencies, as Robert mentioned, but I also think you um, somewhat limit your buyer pool when you're going to exit as well. Yeah, and, and you're right, Adam, there's, again, that's one of the negatives that people have, have pointed to, like, hey, this is not as tradable as a multifamily asset. Um, and again, you know, I think historically speaking, you could say, yeah, they're right. But I do think that the, the renter uh, nation, if you will, is becoming more of a renter nation. So I don't know, you know, I, it kind of feels like 10 years, 20 years from now. Yeah. There's probably going to be a lot of BTRs trading out there. So it's hard to say, um, but you know, I mean, that's a fair argument today, but if you're going to hold it for 10, 15 years, meh, that doesn't really become as much of an issue. <laughs> sure. So, but okay, know. time for one more. I'll come off. Hey, how's everybody? Um, yeah, good. Hey, Ross. Hey, Robert. How are you? Good, man. Um, good to see you. Good to see you. Question: um, Do you always target VCs and value adds? Do you ever think about Class A's and? Um, I guess potentially walking into a recession as a class A, even an option. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's why we started the new development side of things, because I wanted to get into class A and not pay class A premiums. <laughs> so, you know, just an example, I mean, Lake Vista, the one we're doing in San Antonio, we're going to be into that thing for a buck 50 on a class A property. You can't get class A for buck 50. You're paying two and a quarter in San Antonio all day long. So the idea is we build it. We don't pull every penny of equity out. We recap it at a reasonable leverage. And then we enjoy the cash flow on a class A asset and we balance the portfolio. So that's kind of the thought process there for me is, hey, now you're picking up that A plus credit quality. You might not have as much rent upside. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I mean, historically speaking, it's not as good. Um, as the B and C, the workforce side of things. But yeah, you've got some nice quality assets with some good credit quality tenants. And, you know, that's a nice, nice piece to have in the portfolio. So um, I don't know if that's kind of what you were yeah. thinking. But that's, that's my thought. That makes sense that you're, you're building the classic essentially, instead of buying. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather build it at a lower basis, recap it to ourselves at a five cap instead of a three cap. <laughs> you know, and now we own it for a buck 50 and we can take, you know, seven, 8% out every year comfortably. Um, and if the market continues to do well, you know, that goes to nine, that goes to 10. I mean, shoot, 10% on a class A property. Are you kidding me? Like I do that all day long um, and, and be happy about it. So yeah, that's kind of the idea just to be able to get into it at a reasonable number and not have to take this crazy risk and, you know, pay these nutty prices. I just, tough to swallow. 
I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Rob. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. That's going to bring us to the top of the hour, folks. Um, really appreciate everybody engaging and asking some great questions. It's really been fun. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to do it next month, of course. And uh, if in the meantime, if you want to engage with us one on one, we always have a schedule a call opportunity and happily talk more with you one on one. Always. You bet. Okay. All right. Have a great evening, folks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Take care. Thank you, sir. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.